My name is Malka Singer. I was born in um, outside of Tel Aviv, on the outskirts of Tel Aviv, what year? which uh, 1925. Now, my dad was born in Bialystok, which was sometimes Poland, sometimes Russia. Uh, my mother's family lived just outside of Lublin, Poland. Uh, they left uh, just after the First World War. Uh, well, Jews were not treated very well in Russia, or Poland for that matter. At first, I think he was like all the pioneers at the time, cleaning up roads, trying to uh, uh, guard different communities. I know he used to say that at night they rode on horses with guns. Uh, you know, protecting a community. And during the day, they were clearing up rocks. So this was 19... That was around 19... maybe 17. He, Why did they need to ride around with guns at night? Well, because the Arabs were constantly rioting. There were Arabs who actually, in the middle of the night, would go and just kill people relied on the British to protect us, but they didn't. And that's where citizens of the community would usually be guards at night. Mm -hmm. My grandfather got a parcel of land. When they were given the parcel of land, they built a wooden house. Now that house had two rooms, then they had a porch in the back. Now, they had no electricity, they had no running water in the house. My name is Bilha, B-I-L-H-A, last name Ron, R-O-N. I was born in 1930 in Israel, at that time we call it Eretz Israel. We don't use the expression Palestine. My parents came from the Ukraine, anti-Semitism was so strong, and so they both decided time for them to leave Ukraine, they met each other in Israel. Uh, I, my, I was born in Ranana, that was a very small village at the time, and now it's a big city. At the time, the water did not flow all the way from the mountain, from the Mount of Ephraim, all the way to the sea because of sand dunes stopped all the exit. That's why so much, so many swamps were in that area. They, they drained the swamps and they planted trees. They met each other in Petah Tikva, where they were building the roads there. It was the most marvelous stories they were telling about the time of the Halutzim, the pioneers that came to Israel in the 1920s. They called them the Aliyah Shlishit, the third immigration. But when we were attacked by Arabs when I was three years old and when I was nine years old. There were attacks upon Yarkona, our village. We were very close to the border and um, the Arabs were surrounded. I could see the, the Arab villages from just in, from my bedroom across. Israel at this time was not... And like not a state, today. under this the British the, mandate. Uh, the, but, but you had... Arab villages and his Arab villages and all over villages. and Jewish villages side mm -hmm. by side mm -hmm. in time when we were friendly the Arabs will come in I remember when I was four years old Arab I remember Omar his name Omar he would come he put me on his knees and he was so friendly we had wonderful relations with them and then one day they will attack and they will shoot my father was commander of the Agana of the defense and we, at age 14, we were called the girls and boys 
to swear to the Haganah, we put our hand on a gun, and on the Bible, see that is a Bible, yeah. on the Bible, and we swore that we, the British were looking because, and, and they would try, if they, they catch you, they will, you'll go to jail. Because the Arabs were taking all over the place, and we had to be prepared to defend ourselves. My name is Doron Lux. I was born in Petah Tikva, Israel, in 1952. Uh, both my grandparents were born in Germany uh, and immigrated uh, around 1936. They were probably among the last people who were able to semi-legally immigrate to Israel. Before the war, when the, when the Nazi party came into power, they were basically taken away from their homes, but it was a place in no man's land between the borders of Germany and Poland uh, with very little food and surrounded by guards so they couldn't leave. The Polish uh, people didn't want them back. The Germans threw them out. So basically they were in no man's land. So one day they were just uh, marched into a train station driven down all the way, I think it was like a week's travel, and then boarded a, a ship that, um, moved, uh, that moved them to Israel. Oh, my father was six years old when he came to Israel, mm -hmm. and my mother was f four years. So this is about 1936. 1936, right. Mm -hmm. When they came to Israel, the system was you would come to Israel there was no organization that gave you a house or a place to stay. You basically went to relatives. They would close a, 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 a balcony or a corridor and you would stay there for three, four, five months until you get yourself organized and you rent a place and then and, and you start to work and you make some money. And that's how you start your life as a new immigrant. So I'm Danielle Gorion. And I was born in Tel Aviv in 1946. Well, my grandmother wasn't living at Poland when the war broke out. She was living in Vienna with my grandfather. However, Vienna, uh, Austria became Nazi in 1939, a year before the war, in what we call the Anschluss. So the situation in Vienna was already very much um, uh, dire. There were the flags, the Nazi flags on the buildings and the loudspeakers uh, hurling, you know, the uh, Nazi propaganda. So they ended up running ahead of the, uh, the, the Nazis and uh, came to Bulgaria. And by the, at that time, the Polish government took away the citizenship of all the Jews that were abroad. So they couldn't even go back to Poland, which was a good thing because they would have been exterminated with the rest of the family in, in Auschwitz. So this was illegal immigration. But there were four months on the Black Sea, on the Aegean Sea, on the Mediterranean Sea, trying to break the blockade and sneak into Israel illegally. And how many people were on that ship? About 700. Yes. And when my parents saw the movie Exodus, they said that's a luxury liner. <laughs> they landed near Gaza someplace and they um, they waded through the water to break the blockade. How close could they get to land? Because I would think the ship would, would have a, a deep draft. No, people waited with boats. So they had small boats that would take them off? Yeah, not the people came from land to the ship. It was organized, yeah. And this was in the year of 1939. As the war developed, and the British put a white paper and refused to let immigrants come, only a small number, could come with certificate and refused and, and put in the white paper the Jews are not allowed to sell land, I mean to buy land from Arabs. Arabs will not sell any land. All the kibbutzim and the you know, kibbutz and moshavs, all of them were bought by money to, from the JNF, Jewish National Fund collected money in America, in the world, and bought land from Arabs or or from the government, they paid for, for this land. So the tension became more and more between the British, even though as the war developed, and they would not let the immigrants come. And we knew that they are dying in the camps in Europe, 
We start to hear the news from 1940, even before, like Kristallnacht, we knew what happened in 1938. We knew what's happening in Europe from the news. We knew because of the family were in Europe. In my, my father brought one brother from his ten, family of ten. The rest of them remained in Europe. In 1942, when the Nazis came to the Ukraine, they killed all of them. My mother did not have cousin, a, a, a brother, a sister. There were five people in her family. They killed her parents. They killed my, my father's family. They were my, from all this huge family, huge family of generations that lived there, was left one brother and his wife that happened to be, he was in the, uh, in the Russian army and she was uh, visiting her mother in, in, she, in, in uh, Moscow and with two little children. They are the only one left from this family. Yeah. All the people in my Yarkona, in Yarkona, they did, all their families were in Poland or in Russia. And two in Germany, two families. We did not see a grandfather or a grandmother. We didn't have relatives. We did not know what is to come. I mean, there were no relatives. Only our family and maybe an uncle, uh, sometime this one, or a couple of cousins. How did you find out what happened? In oh my goodness, how we found out. In 1945, the war was over. One day they came together and came a girl 16 years old that escaped from a pit, that she was shot with the rest of them. She crawled out from the pit. She was alive and somehow she came through the illegal immigration, which is another big story to tell. She came and, she, and I was in a meeting when she told the, all these people gathered in the Tel Aviv in a one room and she said to them, you don't have families anymore. They all were buried in mass grave, all of them. Maybe you'll find one here and one there. I don't think, it, she told my mother, there's nobody left from your family. She came from my mother's uh, town. No one left, no one. All the people, men, women, children, old, young, there is nobody left from her family. Mm -hmm. So really, I tell you, the Holocaust, if somebody said, people did know, they know. I can tell you for myself and how I knew. I really, and simple people, I, and I tell you, I, I ask my father. My father lived to be 94. My mother died when she was 82. I asked my father, I remember that day when, when this woman told you, I did not see any crying, any, any screaming, any fainting. There was just silence. How could it be? He said, we were in such a shock. We just could not even react. It was beyond human emotion. We just could not, we cannot even describe. All I can tell you that after that day, my mother's face turned to sadness. She was really, there was sadness in her face all the time. And they didn't talk about it. That is the truth. They didn't talk about it. Now, I'm naming Samuel Rahn, but by the, I was born with a, a Polish name, Rakowski. I just changed my name in Israel and I was born in 1924, in a little, little small town in Poland, and the name is Kazimierza Wielka. The place was not as big as the name is. My father was a very progressive person, a politician, and he was a hardened Zionist, you know? Mm -hmm. But you know what a Zionist in Poland was? A Zionist in Poland was a man who collected from from another man money and send a third man to Israel. Were it several times in a cattle car? Oh, I was four times in a cattle car. Four times? Yeah. And the first time you went in there, what was that experience? I'll tell you something. When you get it in that cattle car, the trouble with this is that you don't know where you're going. Mm -hmm. Whatever they tell you, you don't believe. See, I was in a cattle car because they moved me from one camp to the other camp. But you, did you know that? But most of the millions of people went to dead camps. Right. And they never seen the light of that. But so you don't know where you're going because you already know what's going on. But the, the main thing that you don't know where you're going. When they shut the door up, 
The truth is, you become an animal in that car. And then when you get out from the car, and you get in, in the shower room, and you don't know what's going to come out from that shower, gas or, or water. Mm -hmm. And when water comes out? When water comes out, you know, the first time when we went to a place there, we start singing a song. There's a Hebrew song. Mayim Chai, Mayim, life, Mayim makes life, water makes life. It's a Hebrew song like this. That's, that's, uh, every time you get in in that cattle car, you don't know where you're going. It's uh, the most, I think, uh, generally I think that the cattle cars were the worst suffering of Jews. You know, millions of people were moved in these cattle cars. Yeah. Normally, when I was in a cattle car, I was a day, a night, and the next day maybe. But some people were in these cattle cars coming from Greece, from Saloniki, in August, in, in the summer. When they came to Auschwitz, half of them was dead in their cars. They were traveling seven days without water, without food, without this. Half of the people were dead in there. And what's going on in the cattle cars, the strong people reaching out for air, they don't care, they tramp over young people, old people, something like this. So it's the most frustrating, the most suffering place of the, this. Uh, so you go in the gas chamber, it takes 10 minutes, you're dead. The, you travel two or three days or four days or seven days, nothing. You are, they, they give you, they, they put in a, a bucket of water on the corner and a bucket for, for sanitation. You know, the ghetto Warsaw had half a million people. In two months, from July 22nd to September 18, they moved 356,000 people from Warsaw to Treblinka for that. 350,000 people in uh, two trains a day. They opened up Treblinka death camp. There was no work there, only a death camp. Amazing, amazing story. But I was liberated on May the 2nd, 1945. We were a group of about 2,000 of us was in a forest and then and the night of May the 2nd, the guards disappeared, so we were free. After the war, what happened is that uh, Polish, Polish became communist. So there was a lot of bad things. And then you came back, you wanted your property, they killed you. They killed 1,500 Jews after the war. So I went on the way, I stopped in the city of Katowice. And I walked out in the street, and here I'm, I seen somebody, a friend of mine, it's a, so he said, why don't you, why don't you me, why to join us? He was working for the Brecha. You know what the Brecha is? The function of the Brecha was, first was to organize all the young people mm -hmm. for purpose to, to smuggle them into Palestine. Mm -hmm. And then there was very bad things in Poland. There was a quarter million Jews came back from the Soviet Union, who survived. So there was a big pogrom in Kelce. So it was a panic. So we, we moved thousands of Jews out of Poland, smuggled to the borders. We smuggled them to Germany, and we smuggled them to Italy. So from there, they, wherever they go, they went to all kinds of places during the time. So I was a foot soldier, smuggling to the borders. We, you know, this job, this job was probably my best job in my life ever been. I had, we had, we had, in Poland, fighting with the monasteries to get the Jewish kids out there. I happened to have a group, I, I, you see a picture of it, that I, I smuggled from Poland. It was a little kid, I slept on my back, and then I smuggled them back from Czechoslovakia to Germany. And then when I came, when I had order to go to Palestine legally in March 46, so when we, con we got to a place in, in Germany where they concentrated all the people, the same kids came to that place. So I took the same kids to Palestine, to Israel. How they got to, if it was illegal, how did they get Yeah, to they had, they, they got ships. I think they had 
60 ships, I think, taken to Israel, and the British were intercepting them. Most of them, they took them to Cyprus. They had two big camps in Cyprus. So the British were intercepting all these ships. In 1939, mm -hmm. the British government decided, they call it the White Paper. Mm -hmm. They decided to stop Jewish immigration, except for five years, 15,000 people can come a year. 15,000 people a year for five years. And at the same time, they restricted that Jews cannot buy land from Arabs either. What, what do you want to know? My name? Yes. Ruth Sultan. I, I was born, my name was Sima Nicholsberg. And there was this gentleman by the name of Yitzhak Zuckerman. He was one of the leaders of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. He told me that I should go and work for the organization who is working to help survivors go to Israel. The name of the organization was Bricha. I went from town to town, from city to city, smuggling people over the borders. They were, we collected people from Austria, from Hungary, from Czechoslovakia, because lots of survivors went back to their homes to look for their family. We had to gather them and send them from border to border to get their ship to Israel. Mm -hmm. We took them to, to the Alps. We get up, walked up with them, and the other side, there were others who took them down. Of course, the British didn't let them in. There were problems. Like the Exodus was sent back to Hamburg. The Exodus was already in Israel. The British sent it back. So how did you get them, the children, to leave, those people? We, we went from town to town to look. Mm -hmm. We found them. They were crazy. They were already not Jewish children. They already wore crosses. They were some when ad ad were adopted by, by the Christians. Some children, the other people loved. He didn't want to give them a map. And we had to take them and we took them. Did you ever meet anyone that you helped bring over? Lots of people I met. I came in Israel. When I arrived in Israel, the father had a little grocery store in a village. And Esther, the little girl, was playing with non-Jewish kids. There were no other Jews. So Paul spent the house, the grocery store, with the Jews, with the parents. So the little girl survived. And I came over there and I found the girl. And of course, she didn't want to go. And the adopted parents didn't want to let her go. So, when she went to school, me and the boy drove down. He said, Esther, get in and we give you a ride. And she never went back. And now she lives in Israel. She's a grandmother. So why wouldn't you want people to know about that beautiful thing? Yeah, no, but I did a terrible thing by kidnapping. No, you did a mitzvah. What can they do to me now? Yes. I'm 90 years old. Well, I don't know. I, you know, I was a young girl. What made me... I could have find a guy, got married. Mm -hmm. The others did. Go to the P-Camp and, make, you know, meet somebody and that's it. But I didn't do it. I don't know why not. I just went on from place to place, from deed to deed. I, I, I tell you what happened is, I joined a group of survivors, and we were ready to go to, to create a settlement. At the beginning, in 1947, we did not get the trouble from the Arabs. But what happened is, that in November 29, 1947, 
they decided in the United Nations to divide Palestine, remember this? That started trouble with the Arabs. We were getting supplies and, and, uh, and it made by a little piper. You know, Israel had two pipers. You know what a piper is? A little plane, plane. Yeah. two-seat plane. But two weeks later, on December 11, Hundreds of Arabs attacked us. We was only 16 people there with four women pregnant in that place there. So they attacked us. The two guys went outside and they were, they were the first one wounded. One guy was wounded there. And I was wounded on the parapet on the roof there. And I was very bad shape. I was bleeding like, you know, there were no steps to go in from the top roof. There was a, that the guy was bringing mail with a little paper. When he came over, he seen that Arabs attacking us. So he went back to another place, Beteshen, and picked up uh, a, a, a kid from the Palmach, you know, and took the door off of the door. And they came back, they threw a, a few hand grenades and the Arabs disappeared. It's too heavy. The, the, the Arabs ran away. <laughs> so, yeah, the British leave the day when Ben Gurion announced the state. Which on, was when? on May, 14th of May, 1948, mm -hmm. I, I wake my wife in Israel. Uh, she was she was young. Day I didn't pay attention to her. She was 17 years old when I first met her. And you were how old? I was five, six years old, though, and I got wounded. And I was in the hospital in Tel Aviv. She came to visit me, mm -hmm. and she apparently got well, <laughs> so. We, that's where we start doing for God. And that's why we married in '49. In 1947 and 1948, uh, we had a greatly anti-Semitic State Department, which I may talk about in a few minutes. Every passport uh, that was issued that year by the State Department had a stamp in it, an actual stamp in it that's, that said, uh, not valid for travel to a foreign country for purposes of serving in a foreign army. I was 18 years old. We knew that the Arab countries, surrounding Arab countries, five surrounding Arab countries, were going to invade Israel. They said they would. Uh, I saw a bulletin, uh, a notice on a bulletin board that said the National uh, Students Association was going to have a ship going that summer to England, and then we were supposed to get uh, a free passage to France for a week, and only two uh, listings in the entire French, uh, Paris, in the t entire Paris phone book began with the word J-U-I-F. <laughs> and I took the underground, a subway, to the, to the first one, and it turned out to be a kosher butcher shop. And uh, I asked uh, the, uh, the manager where the French, where the Israeli embassy was, and he said, oh, they're just building it, and, uh, and he gave me the address. Yes. There was a secretary in there, and I, she asked me what I wanted, and I said I wanted to join the Israeli army. And she got a little piece of paper about this big, and she wrote out an address, didn't say one word to me. A two-room apartment, and sort of Haganah posters on the wall, and two Israeli young men there. How do we know you're Jewish? And so I recited the Aleph Bet, and uh, <laughs> that satisfied them, but they knew I was quite young. They had three doctors that examined people, and I passed that, and they gave me a ticket uh, to Marseille. And they gave me the papers of a, a displaced person who had survived the Holocaust uh, in a, I guess, a work labor, German work labor camp named Zerich Itzkovich. And so here I was, a Holocaust survivor, uh, a, a uh, displaced person, and I was from Danville, Virginia, but uh, it's hard to describe this, shi this uh, ship in any real way. It was a banana boat, a, a, a banana boat, and all around, if you look around this room, you would see shelving, three shelves high, three shelves high, uh, a bare light bulb in the middle of the room, and we were each given a place on a shelf 20 inches wide. Now they put 1,700 people, 1,700 people 
on the ship, and I think there must have been six uh, lifeboats. 24 other Americans had just come from the United States, joined us, so there were about 25 of us. Of course, there were no toilets. It was built to carry a crew of 13 people, 13 laborers who worked in the holes of the this banana boat. There were 25, say, of us, and 1,700 displaced persons, and they were used to this. They, they hadn't lived this well in the slave labor. The climax of this is when we arrived, finally, after five days uh, in Haifa, Haifa Harbor. Uh, we weren't really home yet, because the United Nations had observers at the docks to check everybody who got off of that ship to make sure they weren't foreign volunteers volunteering for the Israeli army. A little tugboat came over beside the ship and uh, we were asked to jump down, the Americans, uh, the 25 of us, and so we jumped down and people caught us when we, we jumped down. It was at night and the little tugboat chugged away and went over to another part of the dock and we evaded uh, the United Nations observers who were trying to keep all foreign volunteers from coming in. I'm talking about after 1948, Israel was young. It was a young country, not prepared uh, to accept so many Jews. What do you do? How do you solve this issue? So they started to, uh, first of all, the uh, American Jews, you know, all the donations. Golda Meir at the time used to go to America all the time, from from a state from one state to another state to get donations. We need, they needed at that time housing. Where are you gonna house those families? And, and these uh, are the people that were in the camps. Yes. Talking about after World War II. After, and even after that. In the, in the TP camps. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. And then you had to trans f uh, transport them to some places, normal housing. How many people can live in one bedroom or just like a big studio. It was a very big economic problem. And, um, and each immigration f faces different problems. Hi, my name is Dov Zucker. Uh, I was born in 1936 in Landshut, Poland. The war broke out in 1939 and we passed to the Russian side of the border. My father was taken after a short time to Siberia to work in the coal mines and I was with my mother, I was by that time maybe four years old, I was the man of the house. You know, there was no running water, there was no electricity, the, the food was potatoes. We survived, you know, they didn't kill Jews, there was nothing to eat, but we, we were able to survive. In uh, 1945, Five, Stalin was allowing the Polish Jews to leave Russia. The Russian Jews were not allowed, but the Polish Jews were allowed to read. There were 300,000 Polish Jews that came to Russia. And uh, from there, my, uh, my mother had an uncle in Belgium. So he came over and smuggled us out. He made some, made some papers up and we were able to move from the DP camp to Belgium. And we were there for two and a half years, and then the state of Israel was established. You know, after all this, what was happening to us and being discriminated and called dirty Jews and Jews go to Palestine, you know. So we needed to be in a place where everybody is basically Jewish and they don't discriminate just because you are Jewish. Anyway, we went by with a Greek ship from Marseille. And uh, at that time, food was rationed. It wasn't good condition. But I thought that I'm in paradise. Nobody's calling me Jew. I see policemen. I didn't believe policemen are Jewish. I didn't believe the porters that were carrying stuff. They cannot be Jewish. Jews don't do this type of thing. But they were Jewish. And uh, I was even looking at the birds. Is it possible that the birds are Jewish? I mean, it was for me a tremendous uh, experience like freedom, you know, and my, my, mother's, fa my mother's brother had a, a boarded house in Tel Aviv so with wood on the windows, no floor. But my father said, can, I, can we move into the, the, out of the tent? 
So my father decided we are going to sell corn. We're going to, he, bought, he had a big pot that you put corn in there with water. And people would pass by, you sell them a corn, you know, with, with some salt. And I was standing there helping, we're selling corn. Outside your house? <laughs> yeah, outside the house, corn on the cob, you know, outside the house, you know. I was sleeping with my father on the terra, kind of a porch that was on the floor, on the first floor. And my mother was inside and my sister was in the hallway, a little bed there. So the condition wasn't that good, but we didn't complain, we were free. And uh, I started school. Uh, for me, it was a new experience. I had to because I, I, my first school was in Russia, Russian. Then came back to Poland. It was Polish. Then I get to. Then I didn't go to school. Then I came to Belgium, French. And then I came to Israel. I had to study. I had to speak Hebrew. You didn't speak Hebrew. No, not very little. You know, maybe I went a few. I spoke Yiddish mostly with my parents. Then when I finished eighth grade. It was recommended. It was also my mother had an influence. She says, you know, you need to have a profession. No matter what, if you go later on to school, that's a different story. But you need to have something. So I went to Ort. The family Ort, I was accepted to Ort. It was in Jaffa. And uh, it was a vocational high school. I went for four years to that high school. And uh, then uh, when we finished the fourth year, that's when the Sinai war broke out, what was 1956. What was, what was that? Can you describe that? The war? Yes. Well, it was, uh, Nasser was the leader of Egypt, and he threatened to uh, always to come and, and uh, conquer, uh, to, to, to fight uh, Israel, you know. But then the, the French and the British got involved. They didn't want. They wanted to occupy the Suez Canal, so they have because he was blocking it constantly whenever he felt like. So the Israelis got involved too, and uh, got into Sinai and occupied Sinai. At that time, Israel did not have technical people. There were no Jewish auto mechanics or Jewish electrician. This was not a field that Jews really learned at that time, you know. Jews were not, so they needed auto mechanics, tanks mechanics, airplane mechanics. So the entire class that graduated was dispersed into various technical uh, segments of the army. My name is Zev Gurian and I was born in the old Soviet Union in the UL mountains about three months after the end of World War II. Stalin agreed to let anybody of Polish descent leave Russia and in Germany my father be, we were in a, a DP camp, a displaced people camp and it's amazing how, how vital um, how much vitality Jewish people have, even as refugees. They've established a vocational school, a theater group, a soccer team, a kindergarten, everything. It's just amazing. Immediately after the independence war, 1949-50, um, Israeli military was, was nothing. So a lot of the Israeli operations against the border, uh, mm -hmm. across the border, failed. And, and, and units will, will basically retreat without completing a mission, and units would leave dead and wounded people on the enemy side. So Ben Gurion and Dayan went to, to Arik Sharon, who was a 21-year student, history, at the Hebrew University, and told them, we have to start changing the perception of the Israeli soldiers. And he formed a small unit. It was called Unit 101. And they retaliated in the same way as the Arab Fidayin did in, in Israeli villages. The main purpose was to basically instill fear. Say, you guys are doing it to us and we can do it. And they did the amazing thing. It was a unit of 10, 15 people. And that spirit or discipline that you never retreat until the mission is accomplished. 
You never leave a body of a dead soldier or, an, or a wounded one in enemy, enemy territory. It became the foundation of the values of the IDF. My name is Tovo Rabinsky Farkas. My maiden name is Farkas, which is a Hungarian name. I was born in Brussels in April 22, 1944. Uh, we didn't have no money because whatever, even whatever my dad had, and especially the apartment we had to leave behind. And when he, when we went in Israel in 19, May 1951, he had to leave everything behind. We went to Israel, I think maybe with maybe $40, with a very small amount of money, we went with a ship. We could have only a, a small bag of clothes and we got to Israel with nothing. You know, in 1951, you couldn't go to Israel. Okay. You had to wait, you had to buy your way. So how did you get there? Well, my dad gave all the money and everything, whatever he had, he left everything behind. He didn't want anything. And somehow he got the visa and we were able to go with nothing. But other people, you know, they stayed till 1956, I think, 1956 or 1957, that you could have lived the Russian occupied territories and go to Israel if you so thought. The, the Russian government wouldn't let you leave. Is yeah, exactly. Yeah. We lived in a Mabara, Mabara is an absorption center that in like in a Tsrif, you know what's a Tsrif? Yeah. A Tsrif is a hut made out of thin. We would we lived there for like a year and a half and it is one big room from thin. In the summer it's hot like an oven. And in the winter, you got an orchestra because it's raining. No running water, no toilet. We had to go, you know, out to the toilet and out to the running water and take a shower. My father got a job work. He was working doing the roads, you know, the roads. And he was like a really an educated, nice person, had to work the hard, hard labor. We being, you know, it didn't make a lot of money. We didn't have no money or nothing. So my older sister, Esther, and my brother, they were sent to Jerusalem to boarding school, and we never wanted to go back. Even though many people, you know, went back to Romania, to Hungary, because they couldn't take that life. My brother having his bar mitzvah when we were in Hartuv, and uh, he had to pay us, you know, he was a cute boy. And uh, obviously we didn't have too much, so my mom bought two chickens, and she put them outside, you know, it was on a Thursday. She put them outside, she tied them up outside our hut so that the next day on Friday she can take them, you know, to the shoichet and, and so that she can make chicken soup and chicken. But at night a fox came and ate up one of the chickens and we were left with one chicken for six people and we also had my, my, my father's sister that survived Auschwitz and her husband came to celebrate with us my brother's bar mitzvah. My brother has two children, a son and a daughter. And when his son was bar mitzvah, he made the big bar mitzvah because he said that has to be made up for his bar mitzvah and for his son. And it was really a beautiful celebration. Started in Israel, even though it was in hardship and we were much better off before, back in Brasov, but that is part of our past. It's not important for us. It's only a place that we were born. So all this period, you know, when, when I, we were growing up, um, terrorists, at that time, they were called uh, fid, uh, Fidain, mm -hmm. would come in from Egypt, mainly Egypt and Jordan, into small kibbutzim, and throw a grenade into homes, or get into a settlement and kill a family. And this was all the time, or in the, in the Golan Heights, they were shooting on the kibbutzim and killing people. So in between, Israel all the time responded in, in skirmishes. So it wasn't a peaceful time, but, but it wasn't a declared war. Israel in the second half of May 1967, was full of doom and gloom. Okay. I remember our foreign minister, Abba Ibn, who was very well known, mm -hmm. traveling from one civilized country to the other one, France, England, US, every place, and saying, please do something. Nobody did anything. And 
Egypt basically broke international law, clearly, because what they did is they closed the Straits of Tehran. To, to add to, to this, on June 2nd, which was a Friday, um, Jordan joined that pact. So now you have Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. So Monday, which was June 5th, Israel started with an attack. Mm -hmm. uh, within 40 minutes, there was no Arab Air Force. And the bombing was done on airfields in Egypt, in, in Iraq, in Jordan, in Syria, and all around. So within 8 o'clock uh, in the morning, by 10 o'clock, there, no, there, there were like 450 airplanes gone. At the same time, armored forces started to move into the Sinai. By Monday evening, uh, a major part of the operation in, in, in Egypt was, was already almost done. Now, Jerusalem at this point is occupied. Jerusalem is divided. Divided. There was never a plan to really uh, liberate Jerusalem. When I was growing up and I, I learned to swim in, at the YMCA, mm -hmm. which is just across from the, the King David Hotel, okay. and the King David is exposed to, to the wall, right. w when we would get off a bus, Sometimes a Jordanian soldier will just play and shoot. So when Jordan started attacking, Jerusalem Brigade had the armored division, mm -hmm. and they moved up on the mountain hill, and, and, the, and the infantry got ready on the other side. Um, so uh, we came from one side, they came from the other side. Everybody was rushing towards the Wailing Wall, and the Wailing Wall Today you see it because it's, it's large and there's a big opening plaza in front of it. Mm -hmm. When we came in on that Wednesday, the, there were houses. Okay. There was no plaza. There, there was no plaza. There is no access. But what's more is it's all mined, all land mines. Mm -hmm. The whole old border between West, West Jerusalem and East Jerusalem mm -hmm. had anti-personnel mines from the 48 war. And, All that's, where, and that's where you came That's where, the, where I spent 50 days, and that was really terrifying. I mean, yes, I fought on Wednesday afternoon in, in the old city, and I had a few friends killed. Even though one of the major causes of the war was the, the continuous attack and shelling from Syrian mm -hmm. heights, from, mm -hmm. on the Golan Heights, um, Diane, did not attack Syria until the last one and a half days. And, and there was a lot of concern about how many casualties will happen if, when you go up the hills. So, but in the, on the final day, on, the, on, the, on a Thursday, all these kibbutzim came down to Tel Aviv, to Dayans and the chief of staff's offices, and basically said, look, look, if you're not going up there, all of us are leaving. So then Israel went up there, and there was some very serious uh, fighting, and we took the Golan. Uh, was involved in the situation in the Suez Canal, a shooting war of about two, two and a half years. Why did it start? 1970, Israeli on one side of the Suez Canal, and the Egyptian on the other side, and basically the Suez Canal ceased uh, functioning and nothing was going through that. Yes, there were operation on both sides. They tried, um, most of them failed. Uh, our side crossed more than once. There were several operation. Information, who's on the other side, what kind of uh, weapon they have. Some of them was uh, putting listening bugs on their communication lines. I was released in, I believe, March of 73. Mm -hmm. and then went home and then in October the war started right the first days of the war were a total surprise uh, Israel was not ready uh, didn't think that it will happen and was caught um, surprising uh, by by the attack of the Syrian so the Syrian division, especially on the southern side of the uh, Golan Heights, uh, advanced so far, way beyond 
their, their uh, targets that they had at the beginning when they planned that attack. And they were afraid that they are drawn into a, uh, into a trap. The, the, the fact that they stopped for the night gave us the opportunity to call in all the reserve units and first thing in the morning mounted a counter-attack. And if we had to mount a counter-attack while they are in Israeli cities, that would have been a very bloody uh, uh, battle that would have involved civilians. But there was nothing to stop them other than their own decision. When you're a medic, the only thing you see is injured or dead people. Mm -hmm. Because the first two days, uh, the first day of the war, there was an, a surprise attack, our soldiers basically retreated to that line and they were advancing and you could see them and that's where we started our, our war and climbed our way back up on the western hills of the Golan Heights and then pushed them back uh, all the way back into Syria, uh, back to the pre-73 uh, borders. We, I took care of uh, Syrian um, wounded soldiers. Is there people that were captured? They were captured. Uh, I mean, there were soldiers on the other side. We, our job was to kill them, their job was to kill us. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we knew though, or at least felt, that an Israeli soldier if he falls into the hand, will not get the same treatment. Mm -hmm. But I, we didn't think that, uh, or at least I didn't think, that, it, uh, that because of that you need to, to, to um, stoop to their level. Mm -hmm. It's just not the right thing to do. My name is Ilana. Uh, Ilana, my maiden name is Goldberg, and my married name is Gross. I was born March 20th, 1954. I was born in Latvia in Riga. And through Hayas, it's a Jewish organization who helped uh, the Jews to reunite with their families, um, we got our visa in a, what's, to immigrate to Israel. Mm -hmm. the, at the age of 18, uh, you go for a special training. Everybody goes through the special training for one month. I was alone and I was listening to the communication mm -hmm. on the other side. And suddenly you listen that all the Russian advisors, at that time the Russians were in Egypt, all the Russian advisors are living, not by themselves, but with their families. The, f the first bomb that fell, it was on our base. And actually, I, I heard the pilot who took off from the base in Egypt. Yeah, well, we're, yeah. With that close. Yeah, well, it's intelligence. We're all now there. The, our base was hurt. My friend was killed. Mm. We were not exactly prepared, mm -hmm. you know, and he slept in his room when the bomb fell. So, yeah, it was pretty sad. But in 73, there was a surprise attack, as you know, in Yom Kippur. What what they do over there is, uh, is when there's, there's like a major holiday is, you know, a lot of people want to go home mm -hmm. and the Syrians came down a long way. They, they, there was just one battle left and if they had conquered it and succeeded, they, all the way down to, towards Haifa was open. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this national slogan or not slogan, the national motto about Masada, mm -hmm. you know, is, is real. And that's the way a lot of Israelis feel. It's real. And, you know, the whole country is saying there will never be another Masada.